Chapter 28 Experiences on the British Front Lord Newton How I Got Out Sir W. Robertson The Destroyer First Experience of Trenches Ceremony at Bethune Mother The Ypres Salient Ypres The Whole Territorial General Sir Douglas Haig Artillery Duel Kingsley Major Wood Paris I had naturally wished to get out to the British front and to see things for myself. And yet I had scruples also, for when soldiers are doing a difficult job, mere spectators and joyriders are out of place. I felt what a perfect nuisance they must be, and hesitated to join them. On the other hand, I had surely more claims than most, since I was not only compiling a history of the campaign, but was continually writing in the press upon military subjects. I made up my mind, therefore, that I was justified in going, but I had as yet no opportunity. However, it came along in a very strange way. It was in the early summer of 1916 that I had a note from Lord Newton, saying that he wished to see me at the Foreign Office. I could not conceive what he wanted to see me about, but of course I went. Lord Newton seemed to be doing general utility work which involved the interests of our prisoners in Germany, as well as press arrangements missions, etc. The former, alone, would be enough for anyone, and he was exposed to severe criticism for not being sufficiently zealous in the cause. Newton the Teuton, sang the prisoners, a parody on Gilbert the Filbert, one of the idiotic popular songs of pre-war days. However, I am convinced that he really did his very best, and that his policy was wise, for if it came to an interchange of revenge and barbarity between Germany and us, there was only one in it. There is no use starting a game in which you are bound to be beaten. Winston Churchill had tried it, in the case of the submarine officers, with the result that thirty of our own picked officers had endured much in their prisons, and the policy had to be reconsidered. Lord Newton is a wit, and has a humorous face, which covers a good deal of solid capacity. He plunged instantly into the business on hand. It is the Italian army, said he, they want a bit of limelight. We propose to send several fellows on short missions to write them up. Your name has been mentioned and approved. Will you go? I never thought more quickly in my life than on that occasion. I had no plan when I entered the room, since I was ignorant of the proposition, but I saw my opening in a flash. No, said I. Lord Newton looked surprised. Why not? he asked. Because I should be in a false position, I answered. I have nothing to compare them with. I have not even seen the British front yet. How absurd it would be for me to approve or to condemn when they could reasonably ask me what I knew about the matter. Would you go if that were set right? Yes, certainly. Then I don't think there will be an insuperable difficulty. Well, if you can arrange that, I am entirely at your disposal. By the way, said he, if you go to the front, and especially to the Italian front, a uniform will be essential. What have you a right to wear? I am a private in the volunteers. He laughed. I think you would be shot at sight by both armies, said he. You would be looked upon as a rare specimen. I don't think that would do. I had a happy thought. I am a deputy lieutenant of Surrey, said I. I have the right to wear a uniform when with troops. Excellent, he cried. Nothing could be better. Well, you will hear from me presently. I went straight off to my tailor, who rigged me up in a wondrous khaki garb, which was something between that of a colonel and a brigadier, with silver roses, instead of stars or crowns upon the shoulder straps. As I had the right to wear several medals, including the South African, the general effect was all right, but I always felt a mighty impostor, though it was certainly very comfortable and convenient. I was still a rare specimen, and quite a number of officers of three nations made inquiry about my silver roses. A deputy lieutenant may not be much in England, but when translated into French, my French anyhow, it has an awe-inspiring effect, and I was looked upon by them as an inscrutable but very big person with a uniform all of his own. It was in May when I had my meeting with Lord Newton, and towards the end of the month I received a pass which would take me to the British lines. I remember the solicitude of my family, who seemed to think that I was going on active service. To quiet their kindly anxieties, I said, My dears, I shall be held in the extreme rear, 
and I shall be lucky if ever I see a shell burst on the far horizon. The sequel showed that my estimate was nearly as mistaken as theirs. I had had some correspondence with General Robertson, and had dedicated my history of the war to him. So much was I impressed with the splendid work he had done behind the line in the early days, when Cowens and he had as much strain and anxiety from their position in the wings as any of those who were in the limelight of the stage. He was, as it happened, going over to France, and he sent me a note to ask whether I would like to share his private compartment on the train, and then use his destroyer, instead of the ordinary steamer. Of course, I was delighted. General Robertson is a sturdy, soldierly, compact man with a bulldog face, and looks as if he might be obstinate, and even sullen if crossed. Such men are splendid if they keep their qualities for the enemy, but possibly dangerous if they use them on their associates. Certainly Robertson had a great deal of fighting to do at home, as well as abroad, and was in the latter days of the war in constant conflict with the authorities, and with an open feud against the Prime Minister. But it is hard to say who was right. Perhaps if it were not for the pressure which Robertson, Reppington, and others exercised, it would have been more difficult to raise those last few hundred thousand men who saved us in 1918. Like so many big men, his appearance was most deceptive, and though he looked every inch the soldier, there was nothing to show that great capacity for handling a large business, which would surely have put him at the head of any commercial concern in the country. There was a Cromwellian touch in him which peeped out in occasional religious allusions. He was very engrossed in papers and figures, and I hardly had a word with him between London and New Haven. We went straight on to the destroyer, and she cast off her moorings within a few minutes. The channel crossing was a great experience for me, and I stood on the bridge all the time looking about for traces of war, which were not numerous. Just under the bridge stood a sturdy seaman, in pea-jacket and a flapped cap, an intent, crouching, formidable figure, with his hand on the crank of a quick-firing gun. He never relaxed, and for the whole hour, as we tore across, his head, and occasionally his gun, was slowly traversing from right to left. The captain, a young lieutenant whose name I have forgotten, told me what hellish work it was in the winter, though perhaps hellish is not the most used for that bitterly cold vigil. His ship was called the Zulu. Shortly afterwards it was blown up, as was its consort, the Nubian. But as two of the halves were still serviceable, they stuck them together, and made one very good ship, the Zubian. You can't beat the British dockyard any more than you can the British Navy, which it mothers. That evening we, we ran through some twenty miles of northern France, and wound up at the usual guest house, where I met several travelling Russians. Colonel Wilson, a dark, quiet, affable man, who had the thorny job of looking after the press, and Brigadier General Charteris, a pleasant, breezy, fresh-complexioned soldier, head of the British Intelligence Department, joined us at dinner. Everything was quite comfortable, but at the same time properly plain and simple. There is nothing more hateful than luxury behind a battle line. Next day I had a wonderful twelve hours in contact with the soldiers all the time, and I will take some account of it from the notes I made at the time. But now I can expand them, and give names more freely. The crowning impression which I carried away from that wonderful day was the enormous, imperturbable confidence of the army, and its extraordinary efficiency in organisation, administration, material and personnel. I met in one day a sample of many types, an army commander, a corps commander, two divisional commanders, staff officers of many grades, and above all, I met repeatedly the two very great men whom Britain has produced, the private soldier and the regimental officer. Everywhere and on every face one read the same spirit of cheerful bravery. Even the half-mad cranks whose absurd consciences prevented them from barring the way to the devil seem to me to be turning into men under the prevailing influence. I saw a batch of them, neurotic and largely bespectacled, but working with a will by the roadside. There was no foolish bravado, no underrating of a doer opponent, but a quick, alert, confident attention to the job in hand, which was an inspiration to the observer. Get out of the car, don't let it stay here, it may be hit. 
These words from a staff officer gave you the first idea that things were going to happen. Up to then you might have been driving through the black country in the Walsall district, with the population of Aldershot let loose upon its dingy roads. Put on this shrapnel helmet. That hat of yours would infuriate the Bosch. This was an unkind allusion to my uniform. Take this gas mask. You won't need it, but it is a standing order. Now come on. We crossed a meadow and entered a trench. Here and there it came to the surface again, where there was dead ground. At one such point an old church stood, with an unexploded shell sticking out of the wall. A century hence, folk may journey to see that shell. Then on again through an endless cutting. It was slippery clay below. I had no nails in my boots, an iron pot on my head, and the sun above me. I remember that walk. The telephone wires ran down the side. Here and there large thistles and other plants grew from the clay walls. So immobile had been our lines. Occasionally there were patches of untidiness. Shells, said the officer laconically. There was a racket of guns before us and behind, especially behind, but danger seemed remote with all these Burns' father groups of cheerful Tommies at work around us. I passed one group of grimy, tattered boys. A glance at their shoulders showed me that they were of a public school battalion, the 20th Royal Fusiliers. I thought you fellows were all officers now, I remarked. No, sir, we like it better so. Well, it will be a great memory for you. We are all in your debt. They saluted, and we squeezed past them. They had the fresh brown faces of boy cricketers, but their comrades were men of a different type, with hard, strong, rugged features, and the eyes of men who have seen strange sights. These were veterans, men of Mons, and their young pals of the public schools had something to live up to. Up to this we only had two clay walls to look at, but now our interminable and tropical walk was lightened by the sight of a British aeroplane sailing overhead. Numerous shrapnel bursts were all around it, but she floated on serenely, a thing of delicate beauty against the blue background. Now another passed, and yet another. All the morning we saw them circling and swooping, and never a sign of a Bosch. They told me it was nearly always so, that we held the air, and that the Bosch intruder, save at early morning, was a rare bird. We have never met a British aeroplane which was not ready to fight, said a captured German aviator. There was a fine stern courtesy between the airmen on either side, each dropping notes into the other's aerodromes to tell the fate of missing officers. Had the whole war been fought by the Germans as their airmen conducted it? I do not speak, of course, of the Zeppelin murderers. A peace would eventually have been more easily arranged. And now we were there, in what was surely the most wonderful spot in the world, the front-firing trench, the outer breakwater which held back the German tide. How strange that this monstrous oscillation of giant forces, setting in from east to west, should find their equilibrium across this particular meadow of Flanders. How far, I asked? One hundred and eighty yards, said my guide. Pop, remarked a third person just in front. A sniper, said my guide. Take a look through the periscope. I did so. There was some rusty wire before me, then a field sloping slightly upwards with knee-deep grass and ragged dock and fennel and nettles, then rusty wire again and a red line of broken earth. There was not a sign of movement, but sharp eyes were always watching us, even as these crouching soldiers around me were watching them. There were dead Germans in the grass before us, you need not see them to know that they were there. A wounded soldier sat in a corner, nursing his leg. Here and there, men popped out like rabbits from dugouts and mine shafts. Others sat on the fire step, or leaned smoking against the clay wall. Who would dream, who looked at their bold, careless faces, that this was a front line, and that any moment it was possible that a grey wave might submerge them? With all their careless bearing, I noticed that every man had his gas mask and his rifle within easy reach. A mile of front trenches, and then we were on our way back down that weary walk. Then I was whisked off upon a ten-mile drive. There was a pause for lunch at Corps headquarters, and after it we were taken to a medal presentation in the market square of Bethune. Generals Munro, Haking, and Landon, famous fighting soldiers all three, were the British representatives. 
Munro with a ruddy face, all brain above, all bulldog below. Haking, pale, distinguished, intellectual. Landon, a pleasant, genial country squire. An elderly French general stood beside them. British infantry kept the ground. In front were about fifty Frenchmen in civil dress, of every grade of life, workmen and gentlemen in a double rank. They were all so wounded that they were back in civil life, but today they would have some solace for their wounds. They leaned heavily on sticks, their bodies twisted and maimed, but their faces were shining with pride and joy. The French general drew his sword and addressed them. One caught words like honneur and patrie. They leaned forward on their crutches, hanging on every syllable which came hissing and rasping from under that heavy white moustache. Then the medals were pinned on. One poor lad was terribly wounded and needed two sticks. A little girl ran out with some flowers. He leaned forward and tried to kiss her, but the crutches slipped and he nearly fell upon her. It was a pitiful but beautiful little scene. Next the British candidates marched up, one by one for their medals. Hail hearty men, brown and fit. There was a smart young officer of Scottish rifles, and then a selection of Worcesters, Welsh Fusiliers and Scots Fusiliers, with one funny little Highlander. A tiny figure with a soup bowl helmet, a grinning boy's face beneath it, and a bedraggled uniform. Many acts of great bravery. Such was the record for which he was decorated. Even the French wounded smiled at his quaint appearance as they did at another Briton who had acquired the chewing gum habit and came up for his medal as if he had been called suddenly in the middle of his dinner, which he was still endeavouring to bolt. Then came the end with the national anthem. The British battalion formed fours and went past. To me that was the most impressive sight of any. They were the Queen's West Surreys, a veteran battalion of the great Ypres battle. What grand fellows! As the order came eyes right, and all those fierce dark faces flashed round at us, I felt the might of the British infantry, the intense individuality which is not incompatible with the highest discipline. Much they had endured, but a great spirit shone from their faces. I confess that as I looked at those brave English lads and thought of what we owed to them, and to their like who have passed on, I felt more emotional than befits a Briton in foreign parts. How many of them are left alive today? Now the ceremony was ended, and once again we set out for the front. It was to an artillery observation post just opposite the Luz salient that we were bound. In an hour I found myself, together with a razor-keen young artillery observer and an excellent old sportsman of a Russian prince, jammed into a very small space and staring through a slit at the German lines. In front of us lay a vast plain, scarred and slashed with bare places at intervals, such as you see where gravel pits break a green common. Not a sign of life or movement save some wheeling crows. And yet, down there, within a mile or so, was the population of a city. Far away a single train was puffing at the back of the German lines. We were here on a definite errand. Away to the right, nearly three miles off, was a small red house, dim to the eye but clear in the glasses, suspected as a German post. It was to go up this afternoon. The gun was some distance away, but I heard the telephone directions. Mother will soon do her in, remarked the gunner boy cheerfully. Mother was the name of the gun. Give her five, six, three, four, he cried through the phone. Mother uttered a horrible bellow from somewhere on our right. An enormous spout of smoke rose ten seconds later from near the house. A little short, said our gunner. Two and a half minutes left, added a little small voice which represented another observer at a different angle. "'Raise her seven five, said our boy, encouragingly. Mother roared more angrily than ever. "'How will that do?' she seemed to say. "'One and a half right,' said our invisible gossip. I wondered how the folk in the house were feeling as the shells crept ever nearer. "'Gun laid, sir,' said the telephone. "'Fire!' I was looking through my glass. A flash of fire on the house, a huge pillar of dust and smoke, then it settled— and an unbroken field was there. The German post had gone up. "'It's a dear little gun,' said the officer boy, "'and her shells are reliable,' remarked a senior behind us. "'They vary with different calibres, but mother never goes wrong.' 
The German line was very quiet. Pourquoi ne répondent il pas? asked the Russian prince. Yes, they are quiet today, answered the senior, but we get it in the neck sometimes. We were all led off to be introduced to mother, who sat, squat and black, amid twenty of her grimy children, who waited upon her and fed her. A dainty eater was mother, and nothing served her but the best and plenty of it. But she was important, and as the war progressed it became more and more evident that in spite of that upstart family of quick firers, it was really the only big, heavy, well-established gun which could flatten out a road to the Rhine. I had the great joy that night of seeing my brother Innes, who had been promoted to colonel, and was acting as assistant adjutant general of the 24th Division, the headquarters of which were at Belleul, where I dined at mess and occupied a small lodging in the town, which was about six miles from the front. One more experience wound up that wonderful day. That night we took a car after dark and drove north and ever north, until at a late hour we halted and climbed a hill in the darkness. Below was a wonderful sight. Down on the flats, in a huge semicircle, lights were rising and falling. They were very brilliant, going up for a few seconds and then dying down. Sometimes a dozen were in the air at one time. There were the dull thuds of explosions and an occasional rat-tat-tat. I have seen nothing like it, but the nearest comparison would be an enormous ten-mile railway station in full swing at night, with signals winking, lamps waving, engines hissing and carriages bumping. It was a terrible place, a place which will live as long as military history is written, for it was the Ypres salient. What a salient, too! A huge curve as outlined by the lights, needing only a little more to be an encirclement. Something caught the rope as it closed, and that something was the British soldier. But it was a perilous place by day and by night. Never shall I forget the impression of ceaseless, malignant activity, which was borne in upon me by the white winking lights, the red sudden flares, and the horrible thudding noises in that place of death beneath me. In old days we had a great name as organisers. Then came a long period when we deliberately adopted a policy of individuality, and go as you please. Now once again in our sore need, we had called on all our power of administration and direction. And it had not deserted us. We still had it in a supreme degree. Even in peacetime we have shown it in that vast, well-oiled, swift-running, noiseless machine called the British Navy. But our powers had risen with the need of them. The expansion of the Navy was a miracle. The management of the transport a greater one. The formation of the new army, the greatest of all time. To get the men was the least of the difficulties. To put them in the field, with everything down to the lid of the last field saucepan in its place, that was the marvel. The tools of the gunners, and of the sappers, to say nothing of the knowledge of how to use them, were in themselves a huge problem. But it had all been met and mastered. So don't let us talk too much about the muddling of the war office. It has become just a little ridiculous. I was the guest at headquarters of a divisional general Kappa, brother of the heroic leader of the 7th Division, who might truly be called one of the two fathers of the British flying force. For it was he, with Templar, who laid the first foundations from which so great an organisation has risen. My morning was spent in visiting two fighting brigadiers, Mitford and Jelf, cheery, weather-beaten soldiers, respectful, as all our soldiers are, of the prowess of the Hun, but serenely confident that we could beat him. In company with one of them I ascended a hill, the reverse slope of which was swarming with cheerful infantry, in every stage of déshabillé, for they were cleaning up after the trenches. Once over the slope we advanced with some care, and finally reached a certain spot, from which we looked down upon the German line. It was an observation post, about one thousand yards from the German trenches, with our own trenches between us. We could see the two lines, sometimes only a few yards, as it seemed, apart, extending for miles on either side. The sinister silence and solitude were strangely dramatic. Such vast crowds of men, such intensity of feeling, and yet only that open rolling countryside, with never a movement in its whole expanse. In the afternoon my brother drove me to the square at Ypres. It was the city of a dream, this modern Pompeii, destroyed, deserted and desecrated. 
but with a sad, proud dignity which made you involuntarily lower your voice as you passed through the ruined streets. It was a more considerable place than I had imagined, with many traces of ancient grandeur. No words can describe the absolute splintered wreck that the Huns had made of it. The effect of some of the shells had been grotesque. One boiler-plated water tower, a thing forty or fifty feet high, was actually standing on its head like a great metal top. There was not a living soul in the place, save a few pickets of soldiers and a number of cats which had become fierce and dangerous. Now and then a shell still fell, but the Huns probably knew that the devastation was already complete. We stood in the lonely grass-grown square, once the busy centre of the town, and we marvelled at the beauty of the smashed cathedral and the tottering cloth hall beside it. Surely at their best they could not have looked more wonderful. If they were preserved even so, and if a heaven-inspired artist were to model a statue of Belgium in front, Belgium with one hand pointing to the treaty by which Prussia guaranteed her safety, and the other to the sacrilege behind her, it would make the most impressive group in the world. It was an evil day for Belgium when her frontier was violated, but it was a worse one for Germany. I venture to prophesy that it will be regarded by history as the greatest military as well as political error that has ever been made. Had the great guns that destroyed Liège made their first breach at Verdun, what chance was there for Paris? Those few weeks of warning and preparation saved France and left Germany, like a weary and furious bull, tethered fast in the place of trespass and waiting for the inevitable Polax. We were glad to get out of the place, for the gloom of it lay as heavy upon our hearts as the shrapnel helmets did upon our heads. Both were lightened as we sped back past empty and shattered villas, to where, just behind the danger line, the normal life of rural Flanders was carrying on as usual. A merry sight helped to cheer us, for scudding downwind above our heads came a Bosch aeroplane, with two British at her tail, barking away with their machine guns, like two swift terriers after a cat. They shot, rat-tat-tatting across the sky, until we lost sight of them in the heat haze over the German line. The afternoon saw us on the Scharpenberg, from which many a million will gaze in days to come, for from no other point can so much be seen. It was a spot forbid, but a special permit took us up, and the sentry on duty, having satisfied himself of our bona fides, proceeded to tell us tales of the war in a pure hull dialect, which might have been Chinese for all that I could understand. That he was a terrier and had nine children were the only facts I could lay hold of but I wished to be silent and to think, even perhaps to pray. Here, just below my feet, were the spots which our dear lads, three of them my own kith, had sanctified with their blood. Here, fighting for the freedom of the world, they cheerily gave their all. On that sloping meadow, to the left of the row of houses on the opposite ridge, the London Scottish fought to the death on that grim November morning, when the Bavarians reeled back from their shot-torn line. That plain away on the other side of Ypres was the place where the three Grand Canadian Brigades, first of all men, stood up to the damnable gases of the Hun. Down yonder was Hill 60, that blood-soaked copier. The ridge over the fields was held by the cavalry against two army corps, and there, where the sun struck the red roof among the trees, I could just see Geluvelt, a name for ever to be associated with Haig and the most vital battle of the war. As I turned away I was faced by my whole territorial, who still said incomprehensible things. I looked at him with other eyes. He had fought on yonder plain, he had slain Huns, and he had nine children. Could anyone better epitomise the duties of a good citizen in days like these? I could have found it in my heart to salute him had I not known that it would have shocked him and made him unhappy. Next day it was June 1st. I left my brother's kindly care. I had fears for him, for he was much overworked and worried, as adjutant generals of busy divisions are likely to be. However, he was never one to admit it or to pity himself, and he begged me to carry the cheeriest report back to his wife. It was a great pleasure to me that so many officers took me aside to say how efficient he was, and how popular. He would not have wished me to say it were he alive, but I can leave it on record now. Yesterday had been full, but the next day was not less so for I had been asked, or ordered, to lunch at the general headquarters at Montreux, 
the funny old town on a hill which I had learned to know well in days of peace. As we drove down a winding drive, I saw two officers walking towards us. The younger of them stooped and beat the ground with his stick, from which we gathered that we were to go slow and raise no dust. We rightly conjectured that so curt an order could only come from the chief's own aid. We saluted as we passed and carried away an impression of a heavy moustache and of abstracted blue eyes. I had a very much more definite impression when he came back presently, and we were all shown into the dining room. I should certainly put Douglas Haig, as I saw him on that day, among the handsomest men I have ever known. He was not tall, but he was upright and well proportioned with every sign of strength and activity. But his face was remarkable for beauty and power. His eyes were very full and expressive, devoid of the fierceness of Kitchener, and yet with quite as much determination. But the long powerful jaw was the feature which spoke particularly of that never-to-be-beaten quality which saved the army when the line was broken in the first Ypres battle, and was destined to save it again in April, 1918, when he gave out his back-to-the-wall order of the day. He was courteous but not talkative at lunch. After lunch he took me into a side room, where he showed me the line of the divisions on the map, saying that I could remember but should not take notes, which was rather maddening. Then we had a long talk over the coffee, but there were several present and nothing intimate was said. He must be worried to death with casual visitors, but still I suppose he need not invite all of them to headquarters. He had, I thought, a truly British distrust of foreigners. He is the worst foreigner I have met yet, he said, speaking of some Italian general. His kind heart was shown when I said that my son was in the line. He gave a curt order and then nodded and smiled. You'll see him tomorrow, said he. I naturally heard a good deal about our generalissimo, besides what I actually saw. I think that he had some of the traits of Wellington, though since the war he has concerned himself with the fortunes of his comrade in arms a great deal more than the Iron Duke seems ever to have troubled himself to do. But in other things the parallel is close. Haig is not a game-playing man, though fond of horse exercise. Neither was the Duke. Both were abstemious with wine and tobacco. Both were reserved, reticent, and had no magnetic connection with those under them. Neither Haig nor the Duke were human figures to the soldiers, nor were they often if ever seen by them. And yet in each case there was the same confidence in their judgment. Haig was a very serious man. He seldom joked, and did not meet a joke halfway, so that his mess was the dullest in France. I have known a staff officer apply for an exchange, so weary was he of this oppressive atmosphere. All this could equally have been said of the Duke, but these are trivialities compared to the great main fact that each brought rare qualities to the service of their country at critical moments of the world's history. There was only one other man who might have filled Haig's place, and that man was the conqueror of Palestine. Extraordinary are the contrasts of war. Within three hours of leaving the quiet atmosphere of the headquarters chateau, I was present at what in any other war would have been looked upon as a brisk engagement. As it was, it would certainly figure in one of our desiccated reports as an activity of the artillery. The noise, as we struck the line at this new point, showed that the matter was serious, and indeed we had chosen the spot because it had been the storm centre of the last week. The method of approach chosen by our experienced guide was in itself a tribute to the gravity of the affair. As one comes from the settled order of Flanders into the actual scene of war, the first sign of it is one of the stationary sausage-shaped balloons, a chain of which marks the ring in which the great wrestlers are locked. We passed under this, ascended a hill, and found ourselves in a garden, where for a year no feet save those of wanderers like ourselves had stood. There was a wild, confused luxuriance of growth, more beautiful to my eye than anything which the care of man can produce. One old shell-hole of vast diameter had filled itself with forget-me-nots, and appeared as a graceful basin of light blue flowers, held up as an atonement to heaven for the brutalities of man. Through the tangled bushes we crept, then across a yard. Please stoop and run as you pass this point, and finally to a small opening in a wall, whence the battle lay, not so much before as beside us. For a moment we had a front seat at the great world drama, God's own problem play, working surely to its magnificent end. 
One felt a sort of shame to crouch here in comfort, a useless spectator, while brave men down yonder were facing that pelting shower of iron. There was a large field on our left rear, and the German gunners had the idea that there was a concealed battery therein. They were systematically searching for it. A great shell exploded in the top corner, but got nothing more solid than a few tons of clay. You could read the mind of Gunner Fritz. Try the lower corner, said he, and up went the earth cloud once again. Perhaps it's hid about the middle. I'll try. Earth again, and nothing more. I believe I was right the first time after all, said hopeful Fritz. So another shell came into the top corner. The field was full of pits as a Gruyere cheese, but Fritz got nothing by his perseverance. Perhaps there never was a battery there at all. One effect he obviously did attain. He made several other British batteries exceedingly angry. Stop that tickling, Fritz, was the burden of their cry. Where they were we could no more see than Fritz could, but their constant work was very clear along the German line. We appeared to be using more shrapnel and the Germans more high explosives, but that may have been just the chance of the day. The Vimy Ridge was on our right, and before us was the old French position, with the labyrinth of terrible memories and the long hill of Lorette. When, the year before last, the French, in a three weeks' battle, fought their way up that hill, it was an exhibition of sustained courage, which even their military annals can seldom have beaten. Next day we travelled through Assure and hit the British line once more to the east of that place. Our official chauffeur had had his instructions, and so had other people, with the result that as we swung into the broad main street of a village, May, I think, was the name, there was a tall young officer standing with his back turned. He swung round at the noise of the car, and it was my boy Kingsley, with his usual jolly grin upon his weather-stained features. The long arm of G.H.Q. had stretched out and plucked him out of a trench, and there he was. We had an hour's talk in a field, for there was nowhere else to go. He was hard and well, and told me that all was nearly ready for a big push at the very part of the line where his battalion, the First Hampshires, was stationed. This was the first intimation of the great Somme battle, on the first day of which every officer of the Hampshires, without exception, was killed or wounded. I learned afterwards that before the battle, for ten nights running, Kingsley crept out to the German wire and stuck up crosses, where he found the wire uncut, which were brown towards the enemy and white towards the British, as a guide to the gunners. He lay on his face sometimes, with the machine guns firing just above him. For this service, Colonel Polk thanked him warmly and said he should certainly have a decoration. But Polk and both majors were killed, and no recommendations went forward. Two shrapnel bullets in the neck were all Kingsley got out of the battle, and two months on his back in a hospital. However, he was not a medal hunter, and I never heard him complain, nor would he wear his wound badges until he was compelled. An hour later I met another member of my household, for my secretary, Major Wood of the 5th Sussex Territorials, was town major of Bokesnye, where I found him at the convenient hour of lunch, he had done nearly two years of hard active service, which was pretty good for a civilian of fifty, and had led his company at Festubert and other engagements. He was now using his excellent powers of organisation and administration in making Bokesnye a well-ordered village, as later he made Doulens a well-ordered town. I expect that the British administration will remain as a wonderful legend of sanitation and cleanliness, in many of these French towns of the northeast, After inspecting Major Wood's work, I went on to Amiens with him, and he packed me into the train to Paris, the first part of my task thoroughly done so far as time would permit. I came away with a deep sense of the difficult task which lay before the army, but with an equally deep one of the ability of those men to do all that soldiers can be called upon to perform. But I saw no end to the war. I had two days in Paris, a very dead and alive Paris, such a Paris as has seldom or never been seen before, with darkened streets and the shops nearly all closed. I stayed at the Hotel Crillon, where were a few Russian and British officers. It was extraordinary the difference which the public made between the two. A British officer was disregarded, while a Russian general, 
I took a walk with one, was looked upon with an adulation which was quite comic. Men came up and made a low obeisance before him. And yet it was our army, our purse, our factories, above all our navy, which were saving the situation both for France and Russia, to whom we were bound by no alliance. There was certainly not much sign of appreciation or gratitude. It is a very singular thing how the whole world alternately leans upon and depreciates the British Empire.